Why do I even need to use symbolism? Can I just say exactly what I mean? Today, we are going to talk about three major benefits of symbolism and why you should be utilizing symbolism in your music. Hello, friend. Welcome to another episode of the Songwriter Theory Podcast. This is episode 122. And as always, I am your host, Joseph Vidala. And today we are talking about three major benefits of utilizing symbolism in your songs, within your music, which of course means we are talking about lyrics, which is always important to talk about because lyrics at worst is a third of your song because when you copyright a song, basically what you're copywriting is the underlying chords, the melody, and the lyrics. So lyrics are endlessly important. In my opinion, it's even more important than just 33% of a song, but lyrics also tend to be a weak spot for songwriters. And my idea of why this is, is because most songwriters, their story is that they were a musician who wanted to start writing songs, writing their own music, and they're like, oh, crap, I guess I have to write lyrics now. They don't really consider themselves poets. There are much fewer people that are poets that then learn music to write songs. So that's at least why I think that is. But regardless, we all could stand to increase the quality of our lyrics One way that I have done that for myself is creating a system and a process. It's a six-step lyric writing process because the reality is that it is very hard and unrealistic, frankly, for you to stare at a blank page and expect yourself to write like a final draft lyric that's really good right away. And going from not even having an idea or just having an idea all the way to starting to write the lyrics can be a huge jump. So a way to make the process easier and to get better results is to break down the process into smaller, more easily done steps. And that's what this six-step lyric checklist is for, where I break it down. I believe step three is actually writing lyrics. Um, And then there's three more steps after that in this process. So if you want to make lyric writing easier for yourself and if you want to not rely on the muse and rely on inspiration so much, which is always a dangerous thing to do, right? Because sometimes you do come up with a song idea and write a great lyric within a half an hour, done. Sometimes that happens, but that is the exception, not the rule. And if you wait for, if you wait to write quality lyrics for only when you're feeling inspired, you're, you're going to write like one great song every 10 years, give or take. We don't want to do that. We want to write quality, have a process to write quality whether we're feeling inspired or not. So if you're interested in that, be sure to pick up the free guide at songwritertheory.com slash lyric checklist if you have not already. But today, we're talking about symbolism. And before we dive in, let's just quickly define what symbolism is. A definition that I found that I really liked was that symbolism is the art of hiding meaning behind something apparently non-related, right? It's like this, you create this image of something where it represents more than what it is. A bird, that doesn't just mean a bird. Maybe the bird represents freedom, right? That's the basis of what symbolism is. So what are the benefits? Let's talk about three of them. First one, it helps to convey nuanced and complex ideas efficiently and artistically. Something I've talked about before if you've been a listener for a while, is one of the simple ways to think through why symbolism is so powerful is that you are effectively drawing a word picture, right? You're drawing a picture with your words. And we know that a picture is worth a thousand words, or at least that's how the phrase goes. And most of us would more or less agree with that, right? The idea behind it is not that it's literally worth a thousand words, but that a picture has a ton of meaning packed into it, right? So symbolism is basically drawing a word picture. So now our three words, maybe, that we use to draw this word picture can become worth a thousand words worth of meaning. And when our songs, on average, are about two to 250 words, right? A longer song will be more like 300, 350 maybe, but most songs are somewhere in the 250 range or 200 range. We 
get amazing, amazing bonuses in, in, in added meaning when we take just one part of that song and insert a symbol that's worth a thousand words, right? If we, if we were to really simplify this into like math, you have 250 words. If you can take five of them and make that worth a thousand words, now you're at 250 words plus a thousand, 1,250 minus five. So 1,245. Maybe overly precise, that part doesn't really matter. The point is that symbolism can help add so much meaning to your songs and really add depth to your songs that is going to be hard to fit into your song without some level of symbolism. So that's major benefit number one. Major benefit number two is that it adds emotional weight. As artists of any kind, our job is to make people feel things. I think our job is also to make people think about things and dwell on things and think deep, more deeply about things. And thinking is an important part too. But at the end of the day, especially with music, we have to make our listeners feel something. If our listeners aren't feeling something with our song and they just feel neutral about it, we have not done our jobs. Now, that's not to say that there isn't room for like certain music doesn't speak to certain people, right? If I hear country music, for instance, usually, usually, at least what's on the radio, so I, I, sh- I shouldn't hate on all country music. I'm not hating on country music. Some of you have sent me some cool country songs that you've written, not hating on that. But a lot of times when you get the overly, like there's tons of steel guitar and the accent, you can tell like the guy doesn't even have a real accent, but he's still singing with one for some reason. Like that type of stuff tends to lose me personally. That doesn't make it bad, Right. You might, or another example is like really, really, really hard rock music. Like I like up to like Breaking Benjamin, Red, Disturbed is about as far as I go. But once we get into songs that are screaming constantly, like I just, I can't, I just, I just can't. It doesn't make me feel things. I just think this is, I I just can't, it's hard for me to take seriously. So we all have those, right? We're not counting that, not counting that. That doesn't matter. That's just a personal taste thing. But people who are your target audience should be feeling things from your music. So adding emotional weight is something that we should want to do. We want to add emotional weight to our songs. And symbolism helps to do that. Why is that? Well, I think one way to easily illustrate why that is, is when you think about history books, And the amount of tragedies and horrific things that we read in history books, and we kind of just read on, right? If you were told to read a a chapter in your history book, and it was about World War II, and you brush over like, and in this battle, 200,000 people died, or I don't know if the number was ever that high, but you get what I'm saying, right? We see all these numbers, but they're just numbers to us. And it's not that we're heartless, horrible people. But that's the nature of just numbers and history books, right? It's like a bunch of people died a hundred years ago. And, you know, it's just hard to bear the weight of that thing when you're just confronted with a fact. When you're told, because we've talked about showing versus telling, if you're told a fact, it's hard for that to resonate emotionally, usually. But if you watch a movie, where you watch just five people in World War II, and obviously they're actors, you're not actually watching them, but if you see that, and you watch that movie and watch the hell they go through for two hours, now all of a sudden you're probably feeling the weight. You think, oh my gosh, the X number of people who died in that battle or in that war, that's how it happened. It was a real person that really was beaten and bloodied and eventually got shot in the head, right? Like, this is horrific stuff. So now you can bear the emotional weight of that thing because now you have this image, or in this case, series of images to go with it, right? It's sort of like in the history books, you know, sometimes they just add an image. It really adds adds a punch, right? It's one thing to read about the horrors of the Holocaust. It's another thing to see a picture of, you know, whatever it, it might be, just people behind you know, the, the, the fences or, or whatever. 
where that adds emotional weight to the thing, right? You feel like, oh my God, like this is, this is a real thing. This is not just a fact in a history book. This is a real thing that happened to real human beings like you and I. So symbolism allows us to move from that fact area, the telling, into the showing. And showing is what's going to get that emotional weight. So an example of this is Breaking Benjamin has a song called Dance with the Devil. And the idea of it is the song is basically about dealing with thoughts of in the temptation of suicide. And it's one thing, again, as a fact to know that you have a friend that's dealing with, you know, suicidal thoughts, depression, things like that. Which is not to say you don't feel for that person. It's not to say you don't understand the weight of the situation, but there's something about if you, if you visualize them and picture them as slow dancing, I I picture it slow dancing. It works better in my head anyway. It doesn't say slow dancing, but I picture it that way. Slow dancing with the devil. And, And however you picture that, right? Maybe tears streaming down their eyes. Maybe they're looking lovingly at the devil. Maybe both, right? What does that mean, right? There's so many ways to read into that. But no matter how you look at that, that's the level of tragedy that you feel and the emotional weight you should feel of the thing should go way up. Because it's such a haunting, dark image that really conveys the dark thing that they're having to go through. And that is what symbolism gives us. Compelling image that adds emotional Wait. Benefit number three. Vagueness allows and even compels the listener to engage in interpretation and deeper thought. So a real problem with today's art out there, specifically movies and a lot of things like that, is things are getting more and more overtly preachy, which nobody likes. (laughs) I always talk about, for me personally, I hate preachy stuff whether I agree with it or not. It's maybe extra annoying when I don't agree with what they're preaching, but it doesn't even matter. If I think you're shoving your opinion down my throat, I'm not going to like it. And a part of that is it's just annoying. And another part of that is that it's not artistic, right? Artistic stuff gives me a story, gives me something, and then gives me something to think about. Right, Because you're not handing me an answer, you're handing me a situation that then makes me ask questions. That's usually what art is, right? Think of it like, to me, the best pieces of art in an art museum are the ones I stop and, and, look, and look at. Because if I look at a piece of art, and I say, yep, that's nice, and move on, that means it, it, didn't, it didn't do its job. Maybe it was too obvious what I was saying. It was overt messaging, Right? It had an agenda. Or maybe it's just boring and meaningless, right? Like, here's a pretty apple. Okay, who cares? Um, But the pieces of art that make people stop and ask questions and think, that, that's what art is or should be. And people don't feel that way. If you're being overt with your preachiness or your overt messaging. And symbolism is a really great way to hand an idea to somebody without overtly saying what it is, where they get to grapple with it for what it is, and they can come to their own conclusion. Because you're not shoving down their throat a conclusion You're giving them a situation and allowing them to dwell on it. It's like the final scene in Inception, right? So symbolism sort of functions as a good way to stay sort of vague. We'll get to the Inception thing in a second. So if we go back to the dance with the devil example, you know, I mentioned the whole like, it doesn't say slow dancing. That's in my head. You might picture it in a different way, right? Maybe you picture the person is slow dancing and they have tears in their eyes and they can't even look at the devil, 
right? Like, which is going down a real dark path of like, it's not even um, consensual dancing. That sounds weird to say out loud, but you know what I'm saying, right? Where like the devil asked you to dance. You didn't really want to say yes, but you're trapped for some reason because it's the devil and he's powerful enough to make you do, I don't know, whatever. Or, you know, maybe you're staring lovingly at the devil because you don't see that it's the devil, right? Everybody else around you is like, that's the devil you're dancing with. This is dangerous, but you don't see that, right? There's so many different ways to read that. And the way you hear it and the way I hear it is going to be different, but both can be really compelling. The way I hear it today and the way I hear it next week might be different. And they both give me compelling things to think about. That's what vagueness affords you or the vagueness within symbolism. It's like the final scene in Inception, right? What made that such a compelling thing that made people keep talking about it and still talk about it to this day is the question of like, was the top going to fall over? And, and what that meant was if it was going to, if it didn't, if it wasn't going to fall over, that means he's still in the dream. And then that asks a whole nother horde of questions, right? Like, well, that's interesting. He didn't even care if it fell over or not. Does that mean that he just saw his kids and he doesn't even care anymore if he's in a dream or not? Because as long as he's with his kids, he doesn't care if it's real or not. Does it mean that, you know, th there's just so many questions, right? Like, I, I don't want to go on forever about this because it's not the main point. So I think I'm, I'm just going to cut it off at that question. But like, I've had hours of discussion just about the end scene of Inception. And we get that because of of, of what the symbol is at the end that we get of him leaving the top behind that before was something that, that, that he cared about deeply because it was his way of knowing, am I in a dream or am I in reality? Because I need to return to reality, right? That sort of vagueness is what creates discussion is what creates things to be compelling. So if we use symbolism, it allows us to create situations like that, or the dance with the devil I just mentioned, leaves room for interpretation, leaves room for discussion, for deeper thought, and it avoids being preachy, which nobody likes. Bonus benefit. <laughs> Vagueness also just allows for privacy and wider relatability. So the reality is if you're writing songs and you're writing songs about people, you know, that can be dangerous, right? <laughs> because these people are going to hear these songs or other people might hear these songs and you are throwing somebody, you know, under the bus. For example, if you write a song about how much you don't like your boss and you're overt about it and your boss hears it or people who know your boss hear it you might get fired or in trouble. So don't do that, right? And hopefully you like your boss because if you don't like your boss, that's, that's pretty miserable. Maybe change jobs if that's the situation you're in. But that's like an obvious example. Or like, you know, maybe you have exes that you still think highly of. You don't want to throw them under the bus. Use a lot, utilizing some level of symbolism or other things that keep things just a little more vague helps it so that they're not thrown under the bus. Don't be Taylor Swift, right? Everybody knows when she writes a song usually, oh, this is about this ex. She's throwing so-and-so under the bus this time, which just comes across gross, right? Nobody likes that. Plenty of people like her anyway because people are insane, but, you know, whatever. So petty. And um, another example that or an actual example, because I just threw Taylor Swift on the bus because I enjoy doing that, as you all know. Um, but driver's license. It specifically talks about that older blonde girl, right? So older, blonde, and talking to the guy, you didn't mean what you said to me in that song. Like, this is super specific. So everybody knows, apparently, who gives a rip about this stuff. Everybody knows who that song is about and who the two other people are. Like, real life people. And apparently there's this feud going on. And I think the, the, the blonde girl then wrote a song. I don't know. Whatever. It's a whole thing. Drama. That can be avoided if you are a little more vague and a little more symbolic. And the other side, too, is like, 
I don't know if you guys listen to the songs like this, but usually for me, I start to like lose my investment in it and my ability to sort of place myself as the protagonist of the song, which is really what we all want to do, right? When we listen to a song, we kind of want to place ourselves as the protagonist, you know, as the person singing, right? Because we're singing along. But I get taken out of it a little bit whenever it's like super specific and now I can't relate anymore, right? Like, so now if you're a girl singing along to that song, but you've never had a blonde girl who's older than you that made you feel small, you might start to lose it a little bit. Maybe if you've had a, you know, a girl who made you feel small that some guy left you for or whatever the scenario is, you know, maybe you can still relate and you're like, well, you know, the blonde thing's not true. She was a redhead or whatever, but like every little detail there starts to sort of eat away from the, 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 I don't want to call it a delusion, but like the idea of like, okay, this is my song now. I'm singing along and I can relate to this. Well, sort of, cause I can't relate to this detail or this detail. And soon sort of the illusion is gone that like, this could be your song too. Which is really what we want to feel, I think, when we're singing along. So just as a bonus thing, I think that some of the vagueness that comes from symbolism can help with those two things of like, don't throw people, you know, under the bus. And, um, you know, more people can relate if you're not talking about, you know, the hair and eye color of your significant other. Because if you write a love song about the brown haired girl with blue eyes, you know, now all of a sudden all, all the guys that that like a, a redhead with green eyes are like, well can't totally relate to this song, right? Um, so hopefully this was helpful to you. If it was and you're on YouTube, be sure to drop a like. Also, if you are listening via podcast and you haven't already, I would greatly appreciate it if you left a kind iTunes review. It helps me out a lot. Um, I see a bunch of you have left reviews, which is awesome. I appreciate every single one of you for doing that. I think I'm going to start a thing where I actually read the reviews to give you credit to like call, to like shout you out sort of uh, to show my appreciation instead of me just blankly saying, Hey, I appreciate it. Um, so I might start doing that uh, because I really do appreciate you taking the time. Cause I know it takes some time for you to go to iTunes. Some of you don't even have iTunes, right? Um, so you have to sign up just to leave a review. And I understand that. So I really appreciate you going out of your way to, do that. Even the people that did not leave five stars, I love you all too. <laughs> um, but thank you as always for listening. Thank you as always for watching if you're on YouTube. And I will talk to you next time. <laughs>